<laughs> now I'll turn it down. Welcome everybody, this is a great crowd. It's good to see a lot of same faces uh, out for uh, our third uh, discussion group, uh, focusing on the rise of independent voters and, and uh, the impact that independent voters are having on our politics and could have uh, this cycle and uh, into the next uh, several cycles of what, what that's gonna mean for American politics. So I'm, I'm thrilled today uh, to welcome Scott Morgan, uh, who will be joining to talk about uh, a party of the center, which is, uh, he is the new chairman and founder of the, this effort. Uh, Chief Bottle Washer. And, Bottle Washer, yeah. Uh, Take the trash out. So we'll, 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 this will be a good discussion, so thank you all for coming. Let me give you a little background on Scott. Uh, Scott Morgan is a fifth generation Kansan from Shawnee. His father, Ray, was a longtime reporter for the Kansas City Star covering Kansas politics. Scott graduated from KU in 1979 with a journalism degree and in 1983 with a law degree. He worked for Senator Nancy Landon Kassebaum in Washington from 79 to 80. After graduating from the KU Law School and passing the Kansas Bar, he returned to Washington. In DC, he was staff counsel for Senator Bob Dole on the US Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Courts. He represented the US Senate on the Federal Election Commission and finally served as chief counsel for Senator Dole's 1988 presidential campaign, which I got a chance to work on too. Uh, his, his wife, uh, Kathleen, worked for the U.S. Department of Transportation, ultimately as deputy director of congressional affairs for Secretary of Transportation Secretary Elizabeth Dole. The Morgans returned to Lawrence in 1988 where he worked as director of federal affairs and chief counsel for Governor Mike Hayden. Uh, Scott left that position in 1990 to run as the Republican nominee for Congress against uh, Jim Slattery. Um, Another successful effort. <laughs> <laughs> Morgan served two terms on the Lawrence School Board. He was first elected in 1999 to a four-year term serving as president in 2003. He lost his re-election bid by 66 votes following the closing of four elementary schools due to financing cuts from the state. We really don't need to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all good. It's all good. All good, huh? Yeah. Okay. See, the, the happy ending. He was re-elected yeah, in 2007. Board. First in a field of eight and serving as president again in 2010. Scott, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, I appreciate it. So, I think this is where I'm supposed to say how great it is to be here in Lawrence, but well, you can say I live about two miles from here. So, <laughs> so with that, uh, uh, that Republican resume and that Republican pedigree, you, you, you've gone off and done something a little crazy here I, with this party of the center. Can you give us a warm up and tell us about that? <laughs> what, what am I doing? Um, I'm, yeah, no, it is, it is a strange journey, and I think a lot of us are on this journey. Uh, my family moved here in 1856, and as far as we can tell, have been Republican since there was a Republican party. Um, we have been through many different uh, versions of it, but it was always in Kansas, a, a good, decent uh, group of people to be with. So it's been a long journey to finally say, I, I'm not a Republican anymore. And have, you know, I wrote my breakup letter and said, I, it's not you, it's, I'd like to say it's not you, it's me, but I think it's you. Um, <laughs> and they didn't respond, so I, <laughs> I guess I'm really not a member. But um, it, it, it has been a journey and I've tried different things and I think a lot of people have tried things because it's fun to yell at a wall but eventually you realize that the wall doesn't care and it's, it's not changing anything. 2014, I still as a Republican decided that Chris Kobach was not who we are, did not represent what I thought was the history of the Republican Party. You have to understand, I even met Dwight Eisenhower as a, as a young boy. Um, that, that was one of my great things. My father worked for the Star, took us to Abilene. He and Mamie were coming back to pick their site where they were, the, the chapel is now and the, and the library. And we were walking along a railroad to his car. He'd come in on a railroad and I was walking on the rail. Again, I was a little boy. I slipped, scratched my knee, I was crying. This tall bald man comes out of the back of a train, walks down, pats me on the head and says, don't worry, little boy, I put my pants on one leg at a time, just like you. And I remember going, why is this old man telling me how he puts his pants on? <laughs> but he thought he w I was scared to meet the great Dwight Eisenhower, but I was just trying to get cinders out of my knee. So anyway, that's the, the, the depth of my Republican uh, heritage. But 
so in 2014, I thought, okay, I'm going to find out what's going on. One way to do this is I'm going to run against Chris Kobach in the Republican primary. And I didn't have any expectations that I would beat him. But I would at least be a voice that this isn't who we are, that you stand up to bullies, and that you try to... And then I would find other like-minded people out there, and that I would find that there is a group of moderate Republicans working to take back the party. That's what I thought. I didn't find that. What I found were a lot of people who were happy to see me doing that, a lot of regular Kansans who supported me, but not an orchestrated, organized group that was there to help people like me in those kind of efforts. I lost, and I thought, what am I to do? Third parties don't work, I know that. And I thought, am I a Democrat? And everybody thinks, well, if you're not a Republican, you're a Democrat. I'm not a Democrat, and I could go through the reasons why I'm not a Democrat, but ultimately I thought, we need to have a new party, but I knew that they, intellectually, those don't work. That's the journey that took us to last summer, where we, this group that had helped me run against Chris Kobach, and I like to call him Chris, because I think we got pretty close, uh, <laughs> but um, decided, let's figure out what we can do, because it's, it's pointless to just be mad, it's pointless just to be despondent. You actually, at some point, have to take positive steps to make your world better. And so that's, I mean, I could keep going, but that's where we got to trying to create a party. And, and so how's it going? What Super. The Greatest idea ever. <laughs> it's, um, it actually is going really well in an incredibly chaotic, zoo-like fashion. It is circus-like, that's what right. Zoos are organized, circuses are more chaotic. But what, I mean, what, what we came down to, I mean, the structural reasons why we think a party could work now is in the past, third parties didn't work because parties could adapt to them. They would, whether it was the progressives or the, the populist, whether it was George Wallace, whether it was, uh, um, uh, uh, not the reformist, um, Perot, Ross Perot, parties could still adapt and absorb those concerns. They were big tent parties. I worked for Nancy Kassebaum and I worked for Bob Dole, both really, tremendous, intellectually smart, wonderful people, but had different views on some fairly basic issues, but agreed on 99% of the issues. They disagreed on abortion, they disagreed on guns to some extent, but they could disagree on those things and still work together on a whole lot of other things and still get along very well. That's how big the Republican Party was then, even within Kansas. Now, 30 years later, that's no longer possible. I'm not sure, I know Nancy couldn't be elected as a Republican anymore, and I, I honestly don't think Bob Dole could. And so the parties have become so isolated in the, on the fringe that they no longer have the ability to adapt. And I have four reasons why that is, if you want me to get into them. Please. Okay, because it's, um, I mean, you, you really get into the history, and I, I've got what my wife calls the Scottifesto, um, <laughs> which I'm not sure she meant as a compliment. <laughs> But it's, it, it, we call it Unbreaking America, Starting the Fix in Kansas. And it's just the intellectual journey that we all went on, it's not just me, in terms of looking at the history of parties, why parties exist, and why they no longer can be flexible enough to, um, to serve all Americans. And there are four principal things that have changed structurally. And we see this in all sorts of industries where we've had these big disruptions from telecommunications to airlines to, I mean, there's a whole host of things that this disruptive innovation ha have come into. And in, in parties, you ha they had four principal ways of controlling things. They had money, they had media, they had uh, jobs, and they had ballot access. They slowly, over the past 125, 150 years, have lost those, uh, those points by which they controlled the parties. And to the extent now that they are really shells controlled by interest groups. They no longer, they're called parties, but they're no longer parties as they were previously known. They are small groups of, of deeply de dedicated interest groups. The money, that used to be where they were the source of money. Um, you have some reforms changed all these things, well-intentioned, good reforms, but that had unintended consequences. You had McCain-Feingold, which was to get rid of soft money, and then you had United, Citizens United. All of those things led to where the money was no longer controlled by the parties. It's controlled by these. And prior to that, the, the Watergate reforms. Of the, of the, right. And that's 
And by the way, when I served as the representative of the U.S. Senate on the Federal Election Commission, that was a position that was later declared unconstitutional. So I, not everybody has a job that's declared unconstitutional. <laughs> it was a conflict of interest there, or not on my part, but of uh, separation of powers, the legislative and the executive. But yeah, you had all those reforms come into place which slowly uh, took away the party's ability to control candidates through the money. A lot of good things there, but lots of bad things because other people started controlling those candidates through their money. You had jobs, it used to be all patronage, they had a lot of control because they gave you the highway jobs, they gave you the all sorts of state jobs. Well, for good reason, they in instituted civil service reform because you wanted people with merit. Over the years, now we have largely civil servant jobs. They lost those jobs. That was another thing that parties used to control people so that they would be able to adapt to different, and make sure they had a broad view. You had, um, I always have to remember my M's here, the media used to be a few newspapers that were largely, you had a Republican newspaper or a Democrat newspaper. That's changed, obviously, just with the explosion of the media, but that's, you, everyone has media. I mean, they, they no longer control the media. No one controls anything, as far as I can tell, when it comes to communication. And then you get to the final one, which is the ballot access. And really, that's the ultimate one. It's all about the primary. Right now, we only have two slots, really, on the ballot. Those are controlled by the people who vote in the primary. 17% of Kansans, the adult population of Kansans, vote in primaries. 12% in the Republican, 5% in the Democrats. Those are the, the people who decide who everybody else votes for in November. We always think, well, we'll change that. Everybody will get people out to vote. We'll really work on that. And sometimes you can move the needle a hair by getting people out, but those are 20-year numbers. That's an average over 20 years, and it is a very flat number. It just doesn't change. We don't vote in primaries. And you also have to remember, a third of the people can't vote in the primaries because they're unaffiliated. And so all those things have led to now where parties can no longer change. They are just shells controlled by interest groups in Kansas. And this isn't being critical of them. They did a good job. But Kansans for Life, the National Rifle Association, and the Koch brothers, they control the primaries because they have people who are dedicated to their cause. They have the money. They will get the people out. And in low turnout primaries, they're they decide everything. And so those are the issues that you must have purity on. Nothing else matters. And I, I mean, it sounds harsh, but it's just the reality. And I'm good for them. And I, Democrats aren't as far there. In Kansas, they're just sort of unorganized. But nationally, they're slowly going to go off on the, I think, into the left because they have the same low turnout primaries. And the people who are driven to come out and vote are highly dedicated, tend to be pretty much on the left, um, who will, I think, now that the Clinton dynasty is gone, that they will, they don't think it will happen. I keep getting told, no, that won't happen to us. I think it will. Yeah, it's happening. Yeah. And, and it's hard to stop it once you start moving towards the further end of your base that you can't keep moving up that way, right? No, you, you, you can't, but they, everybody is making money off of these things too. You got to remember that fear drives a lot on the fringe and you have interest groups that send out letter and email and text after text saying, your whatever is in danger if you don't send us money and you don't support these candidates. And then it gets purer and purer because you must always keep the fear factor high or else you lose that. You can't have happy people. Happy people don't, don't give you money. I mean, you want them scared and mad. And but, but isn't that a sad, uh, a sad state of affairs when we're, we're voting more, uh, we're turning out and we're raising money, we're doing all these things because uh, of the fear of what happens if you don't vote for my folks, it's more Wait, voting against somebody than it is voting for somebody. I guess it's sad, but it's also the reality, and what I think is missed in it is most Americans still don't do that. Most Americans are really good, decent people who really just focus on their lives. I mean, they, they pay their taxes, they go to work, they, they want to do right. They have a whole host of views on issues, but they're just not driven by it. It's not what gets them up in the morning. It's not what they do at night. They go to, they do lots of other things. and so. They're left to choose between who the really mad and angry and scared people choose for them because it's all about the primary. So uh, talk a little bit more about where you are with party of the center. Is, 
is it your, your gathering signatures? Right. Are you hoping to add more members? Are you going to put people what, up for office? What, where are you headed? Our point is to try by June 1st to raise or to get 18,000 physical signatures. Now, it doesn't mean you join the party. It doesn't mean you will vote for that party. It means you want another option, another choice on the ballot. If we get the 18,000 signatures by June 1st, we get to turn them into my friend Chris Kobach, and um, he then is part of the process. So we're trying to get more than we need because we don't expect a, a warm reception. <laughs> and then <laughs> uh, our plan would be to have a convention to put together a slate of candidates for the November 2018 election. All that being said, if we don't do it this time, we will do it next time. I mean, this is a grassroots group that is dedicated to doing this. We think that there's this vast unserved crowd out there of people who want another choice, of a kind of a safe and sane alternative to, and, and again, that's not trying to criticize the people who are happy with either one of the existing party. Great for them. I'm just saying that I and a lot of other people aren't being served by either one of those parties, and I'd like to have another option out there. It's, it's kind of like we've become a Soviet Union grocery store where you've got two cans of soup and you don't want either one of them. And not, not really a choice. It's not a choice. I mean, we're, we're consumers. We, we are used to having a selection to choose from. We like brands because maybe we want to stick with that brand, maybe we don't. We don't want to join that brand. I mean, I don't want to become a member of Ford and buy only Ford. I just want Ford to be an option when I go looking for cars. The idea that in politics you would only have two choices and you, should, you have to join that company to have a ch say in who they, they determine, I think that's an archaic system. And it's hard for people because they, they think, oh, we're always had two parties, we always will have two parties. It's really not true. We used to have a lot of factions within those parties and, they, and you'd have coalitions that would kind of readjust and change and come back together and now, they're just these two really well delineated ideological parties, which is great if that ideology agrees with you, but there's no room for you. I mean, I was, I was asked to leave the Republican Party because I didn't agree with them on certain issues. I mean, Chris Kobach issued a press release from his Secretary of State's office saying I should change to unaffiliated because I don't, I'm not enough of a Republican. And I thought, what a weird deal. I mean, that's just, it, that's how surreal things have gotten. So where do, where do you slot in ideologically, or, or, or is the ideology less important than it is having the process piece? And pro nothing sells excitement like process. <laughs> right. uh, no, but it really, I mean, that's the thing. It's not, it is, it's trying to, people try to shoehorn us into a pre-existing structure of ideology. But you gotta look at like what I said about um, Dole and Kassebaum. They existed within a party that had a broad range of ideologies that they would disagree among each other, they might have primary battles, but they would ultimately, they would work together. Um, our ideology is really reflective of what old parties used to be. The, we would, I welcome to our party anyone, say on abortion, on guns, that has a breadth of views on it, they're, the litmus test is they've got to recognize other people have views and they need to be willing to listen as well as to talk and be ready to defend their view. Our candidates certainly will have specific views on those issues, but as far as a party, the, what, makes us, what makes you a member, if there were such a thing, of the center of the party is that a willingness to work with others and to argue for your beliefs, impassioned as you are for them, but recognize that we as a country have wide views of, passion, of beliefs. I don't agree with myself from 15 years ago. I mean, I don't know why we think everybody else is going to agree with us. That, that's absurd. And as a country, I, you know, like the, the whole thing about let's make America great again is such crud. I mean, I think America is great and I want to use that greatness to make us whole again. It's just where we, we celebrate the, the, the differences of opinion that we have but work together and realize that's what makes us really strong is when we bring different opinions to the table and we hammer out those differences. So that's the ideology, but that's not a really very good sound bite I just gave you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but our politics really does not incentivize cooperation. There's no incentive for either Republican or Democrat to go reach across the aisle and try to get along with somebody that, that they, they will be punished if they do that. Because of the primaries. 
That's really the fatal flaw in this whole thing is the, the low turnout primaries because, you know, I, I, again, to go back to my history of watching um, Bob Dole and Ted Kennedy work together um, uh, on the Judiciary Committee and they would, one, of the, one they were both extremely clever and, and funny and knew how to trade jabs and they clearly disagreed on a, a number of things. But they also knew how to work together and how to be friends. And that attitude, I think, could still exist if they weren't afraid of being, you know, it's now a verb, to be primaried. Because if, you're, if you go across that line, it's a zero-sum game. If they win, we lose. And so you do not like them. They are they, we are us, you know, they are dark, we are light. And it's just, that's just strange. That's not how we work as a country. It doesn't exist in any other facet of our society to have that, that either or. It, it doesn't, and the only way they get away with it is because the primary. And that's, then you pick between those two ballots. I mean, there are things like gerrymandering, there, yeah. there's other issues involved. I really still think it comes down to the two selections you have to choose from. Um, because a, a product, even in gerrymandering, if you have a candidate that is more centrist, you have a much better chance. So you could adopt, I mean, adapt and kind of grab some of those votes if you weren't going to lose in the primary. And now it's hard for a centrist to get through a primary so that they could appeal in a gerrymandered uh, district to those people who might nominally be Republican or nominally be Democrat but would, would, would be willing to cross the line for the right candidate, but they don't. They don't. So a gerrymandering only works because we have these ideologically pure candidates to choose from. So uh, in your travels, as you're building this party, uh, who are you seeing attracted to those? Is it independents who naturally come with you? Is it disaffected Republicans? Who, who, who are the natural targets? <laughs> the the nat <laughs> do you want to sign? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, it's actually, it is everybody. The, the funny one is that young people are the greatest for signatures. They, they will sign and they have no loyalty to any of these brands. It's, it, I mean, the beauty of youth is that they view, they see how absurd this thing is, whereas we who grew up with it still thinks it's normal, but it's step back and go, well, this is weird. And so, you offer them another choice, they are great because they don't want to talk really about it. They just want to sign and get the choice. They're not going to join, but they want to have that as a choice out there. So we love places like college campuses where we can find large numbers of them. The other, but there are, as far as people who do want to put more thought, and I'm not saying the young people don't put thought into it, they just have already figured it out. Um, it really is everybody. I, we have Republicans. I mean, in Kansas, it's largely um, independents and, and uh, disaffected Republicans. But there's a share, fair sh number of centrist Democrats who are growing concerned about their party and are interested in something like this. N again, not to join, but just to have a choice. So it really is the gamut. It's just sort of interesting to figure out who's r willing to sign and who's not. And have you found people who were saying, I'm ready to leave my other party and sign up wholesale and, and ready to, to uh, ride to the sound of, of trumpets? Oh yeah, no, we have lots of people willing to be cannon fodder, <laughs> is that what you mean? <laughs> <laughs> to charge the hill. Um, no, it, you do find people that this is what they've been looking for. Most people, it's like, what you really run into is them trying to believe this can happen. It is all about trying to believe. They just don't think this can happen. Yeah. And it's once you get past that belief hurdle, then they're ready. But they just have trouble believing. Well, it's something that I, I, I argue all the time when, when Matthew Dowd was here. We talked about it. The biggest hurdle for these third party movements and for independence is for anybody to believe that it's possible. Because we're locked in this world of what's well, always been one. It's been a Republican and a Democrat, a Democrat and a Republican, and that's my choice. And, and these other folks are just spoilers. What? Yeah, I always love the spoiler thing, as though what we have now isn't already spoiled. I mean, it's just, what am I spoiling? It, it, it's, <laughs> this is such a great recipe that we have. Um, but it, it, for those of us old enough, it's like when the tele, when AT and T was broken up. It was just hard to wrap the, your head around the fact that that little phone, you know, hardwired to the wall wasn't always going to be AT and T. I mean, I I get my long distance from somebody else, and it was just conceptually hard to grasp 
that all of that was, was changing. And did it have to change? I like my world the way it is, but then suddenly it opened up a whole host of opportunities. Long distance got so much cheaper. I mean, it was just, it was a, a it was a disruption. We had it with uh, airlines where you had the traditional, you know, TWA, Pan Am. They don't even exist anymore, but you have all these low fares. I mean, you've lost some things, but you've gained some things. It's just hard to see. History is always linear in hindsight. When you're going through it, it is a mess. It really is. It's zigzag, zigzag. But once it's done, everybody goes, oh, yeah, this is obvious. This is how this happened. I, and this is just because I like to read old books, I mean, books about old dead people, but the, the there is, we think of like the American Revolution and how you know, we make it this glorious event and it was this one, it was a mess. And I, there's this one scene that has been documented in a, a couple of diaries of George Washington um, and crossing the Delaware and, and going to Trenton and to all that. You know, you remember that was just Christmas, it was freezing, the reason he did it was because everything was messed up and his, uh, all these um, uh, enlistments were going up, at, would end at the end of the year. He had to do something. It was, they were freezing out at Valley Forge. It was just, we got nothing. We're, nothing is working. This, we have been routed everywhere. So they have this grand idea. They're going to cross the Delaware. They cross it. And what I, I mean, everybody kind of has heard that story. But it was a train wreck. I mean, the boats got lost. They got split. It was an ice storm. It was the middle of the night, and at one point somebody writes, they get off their boat and they look, and there's George Washington, who's now just a statue, but at the time was actually a person, and he's sitting on a crate that's sitting over there with his head in his hands, and just how messed up could this be? And he's just, you know, what do I do? Because they are two hours behind, the, his forces are split, and he literally gets up on his high horse, his white horse, and just says, no, we're going, we're gonna do this, we're gonna believe we can do this. And they, all the men talk about this guy riding through the mud and willing this horse forward. But he didn't know that was gonna work. He intellectually probably thought it wasn't going to work. But that's the way history is. In hindsight, we make it nice, clean, and obvious. But when you're doing it, going through it, you're just saying, what do I do today? And it's better than just sitting there being mad. You're at least trying to do something. So are you, George Washington is that well, I'm 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 the guy writing about him trudging through the mud about ready to get shot. <laughs> so so what happens if there's some success and you have success and a lot of people uh, uh, are elected as independents or third party folks? How do how do the two traditional parties react to that? And, do, and can they react to that? In the past they would have absolutely reacted and they would have ad uh, adapted and absorbed whatever the concerns were of that party. That's what happened with populists in Kansas. You've got to remember in the 1890s, populists took over our legislature. The farmers were upset. The debt, there's all sorts of issues going on. But Republicans could, ad and Democrats both, could adopt, adapt enough to absorb those. The, the progressives of William Allen White and, and Teddy Roosevelt in Kansas could be reabsorbed in a, in a, because the parties had this power over money, jobs, media, and the ballot. Now that they've lost that, they can't change. It's all, the parties are, we keep using that word so it gets confusing. The parties don't exist as we knew them. They are interest groups. They are little shells of accumulated interest groups that have formed together. Like you take abortion, right to life people, they don't necessarily like guns. In fact, a lot of them don't, but they care so much about that issue, and I respect that, that they're willing to vote for people who are are for guns just to make sure that they can try to get someone who is uh, for banning all abortion. Um, the guns that probably don't care about a, a abortion. Now there are obviously people that are in that Zen diagram that are in all the camps. And then the Cokes, may, they're kind of libertarian to be honest with you. They may not care about either one of those, but they care a lot about taxes. But they've made an alliance and that's what the party is. That party is not going to adapt to centrists. I mean, that, there's nothing in those, for those three groups to adapt to them. They will just hope that the vote gets splintered and they can somehow win. I don't think that's how it's going to happen because I still believe that we as a people are very open to working together and getting things done and worrying about not just one issue, but about schools, about highways, about um, our environment, about a whole host of other things that they really don't have much to say about. So uh, uh, part of the reason I asked the question is, that, did you think Party of the Center is an ongoing venture 
Will there be other parties that, that come along? It, or, or, or are we a two-party system that's, that's out of whack that needs to be corrected? I, I think we are going to have, I don't know what happens when the dam breaks, but I think it will be, I know it will be different. I think once you get a party of the center in, then you can make some structural changes to how we vote, how we yeah. do these things to make sure how everybody, how, just the elections in general, and how that plays out, I don't know. I, the reason I like what, well, I like what we're doing because I'm part of it, I guess, but the, <laughs> the, it, it, the beauty of a grassroots ground up as opposed to one of these national top-down, top down, here, I've got the answer, I'm gonna run the big savior presidential candidate and that'll save us all. It's not how it works. You, you, the reason it's chaotic is we're figuring out what works, what doesn't work. Like I said, if we don't do it this time, we know what we're gonna do differently next time, and it will work. But you've gotta have that flexibility that comes from, well, just being ground up and you know, being a grassroots group. So I, th I don't know what happens. I just know that we've got to get inside the tent using the system as it currently is before we can make the changes that we probably need to make to, rec to reflect our current society. That's why I'm for a party as opposed to independent candidates. Um, independent candidates can be great, but they are kind of a personality driven. Uh, they tend to be for high office like Senate or governor. They don't run for state house. They don't run for county commission. They don't do any of those things. You don't build a bench. There's no systemic change. People don't know if you're independently moderate, independently conservative. It's, they just don't know what you, I mean, you're independent. You, they know what you're not, but they don't know what you are. And a party allows you to have cohesion, to have a structure in place to help people, to get people on the ballot for the state house. And I think people don't know who their state rep is, but that's where a lot of the work really is done when it comes to education, to the things that affect people's real lives. So how do you, uh, how do you deal with the infrastructural advantages that the two parties have uh, as a startup? Are there advantages of being a startup in, in, a, in a digital age that we're in? There is a huge advantage. There is so much money flushed down the toilet by, I uh, probably shouldn't say that, should I? Uh, anyway, just flushed. Um, that, uh, I mean, the amount of money in politics is pretty obscene, and I think that bothers a lot of people. It should. I mean, they realize they're, one, they're congressmen, they're, whomever are always on the phone raising money. It's a 20, you know, it's a five day, seven day a week job of raising money from people who aren't them. And those people have a lot of say in what, what they do and what they, it's not true, you know, pure corruption, it's not this for that, but it is a, a bias that shouldn't exist. But a lot of that money, having been involved in national campaigns, um, and no offense if I signed your check, but the, <laughs> if it was the, a lot of it can go, you wonder, I, you, it's a lot of money, highly paid people who I'm not quite sure what they're doing and I'm not, and I know as a party we can do without. And we are building into our principles the idea of limiting the amount of money we will spend per constituent. It's just a way to not unilaterally disarm but to not get just crazy with it. So yeah, I think that a party of the center, because of its flexibility, because of its kind of insurgent nature, will do quite well in the, the system as it's set up right now because I don't think it's, you know, the other example that gets used by disruptive innovation is in the auto industry. You had Ford and, and GM in the 70s making these horrible cars and uh, Toyota this little, and Nissan, although it was Datsun at the time, come in and those, the big ones, had a chance, had an opportunity to either go down and meet them at the low end of their market or they can go up to their, where they had the profit margin and really push their high-end cars. That gave a foothold to these lowly little Japanese cars, which suddenly, you know, within a short time, those were the cars Americans wanted because they were better built at the time. And then Ford and GM and all those could eventually adopt, adapt, but, and the political system, we can get in. Once we get in, because they'll be dismissive, then we can make some tremendous changes and we can do it because we don't have this whole bizarre infrastructure put in place that is tailored only to one way. And, and that's why, in my mind, as I see things play out, this will work really well. How about on a national level? Are there other or groups, organizations in other states that are doing this? Uh, do you have a, a, any kind of network that's growing? 
You know, we are so focused on Kansas. Um, there are, as you know, a, a number of national groups out there. We have one that has reached out and is working with us, the Serve America Movement, which has the unfortunate website for Kansans as, of Join Sam. Um, we, we tried to explain that that wasn't a good one for Kansas with Sam Brownbeck. <laughs> <laughs> they hadn't thought of that, but um, they, but in any event, um, they, uh, they are, you know, that, well, that's an interesting thing how that happens. That's the nature, when I talk about history being linear in hindsight and when you're going through it, we put this together over the summer last year, really started working on it in the fall and then in, in picked it back up in January. And they had done their thing. They started out as two separate groups, then they merged and then they hired a bit of a staff and then they chose Kansas, independent of us because they thought Kansas was a place and they had their reasons why where they could affect things and try some stuff out. They came to Kansas, found us, and thought, oh, well this is interesting. This is something I, we might be able to use elsewhere. And so they put, you know, time and effort into it. Um, it was fascinating. I went back, they, Kathleen, my wife and I went back to New York. They had a fundraiser with David Brooks. and. That was kind of a surreal experience because one, then they pulled us in and we talked with David Brooks about this. He was aware of it and was interested and know, it was interesting to have him talk about Kansas and the moderate streak in Kansas and the difference between a Kassenbaum and a Dole. But just, there's all these people out there who are trying to figure out a way forward. Um, and that was great, but really it comes back down to you focus on Kansas when you're us. And if other people can figure it out, great. And, but we call it Unbreaking America, starting the fix in, America, or in Kansas, because William Allen White had this great quote, the whole quote's great, but his basic thing was, um, he talked about abolition and prohibition and some other things, but he said like bats out of hell, things come popping out of Kansas. And that's kind of what we are, is hoping that if we can do this here, I think this will have a seismic effect on the rest of the country in terms of people thinking, my God, they did this in Kansas, they pulled this off. <laughs> well, we can do that. I mean, it's kind of dismissive of Kansas, but that's all right if it works and spreads it. So there's a national group, but everybody's trying to figure it out. And you throw things at the wall and see what works and what doesn't. Well, I, I look at things like the, just the base infrastructural advantages that the parties have from their databases and their history of raising money and. Uh, precinct chairs and, and all and consultants and staff and all those things. Do you think we? Do you think a, a new movement doesn't need those, or you can just leapfrog it? I think you leapfrog it. I think that a lot of that is just a legacy from a, a different time, a different era, a different people. I think that I know you don't have to spend the money they do. I know a lot of their infrastructure is pointless. I'm not trying to create a mini Republican or a mini Democrat. This will be an entirely different kind of brand of a party where we vet the candidates for you know, this basic ideology of, which I don't even think it's an ideology, it's more of a process, and hold those out to people so that when they go vote in November, they know here's somebody that, um, without knowing the individual even, but they know that that brand means something that's, that's what, more in line with what they want. Will we win everything? No, but it, will we win a lot more per dollar spent than they do? Oh, in a heartbeat. I mean, that, I, that is not even a close to a question. The cost per vote is gonna be negative. Yeah, and it's gonna be fun, so, yeah. So, uh, do, you, do you plan on, on fielding a, a complete slate this fall, or will it be a pick and choose, or it depends on, on what candidates Wait. step forward? Right, it's what, there is a lot of interest in this. Um, and more and more as we go forward from both existing legislators and other people that are interested in this, but they're not gonna, and nor should they, jump ship until they make sure our ship floats. I mean, that's, and so I th think, I mean, the only, can't, the only offices that would be open this time would be the state house, there's no state senate, and then the statewide. To maintain our certification as a party, we have to just run one statewide candidate and whichever statewide candidates we run have to get at least 1% of the vote. So like on the gubernatorial, we may or we may not run somebody for governor. It depends on one, who's available, and two, how do we affect the other races? I mean, we're not just gonna go in to screw things up. Uh, well, I guess that's kind of what we're doing, but 
we're, <laughs> we're, we're going to look at who the likely nominees would be and whether there might be some that might be in line with what we're, where we are. Then we won't run a gubernatorial. Maybe we'll run a secretary of state candidate. Maybe we run a treasurer candidate. It's just some place where we know we can get 1% of the vote or even have a chance to win. Or, but there are some people that if, I, if things click right, I could see running a gubernatorial candidate that could actually win. That's the weird thing is we are here in March. We are, what, um, seven months away from an election? Nobody thinks we're even gonna do this. There's a very real possibility we could actually have the governor. I mean, that's how surreal this whole thing is and how much pressure I think is behind this dam. Because once you exist as a party, you've already wiped out a whole lot of the issues people have in believing that this is possible. They start, they start thinking, well, wait a minute, this is different, this is weird, but I like this. And then you start getting the right people behind it. And you start kind of, I think, in, invigorating people with a positive message of what you stand for, what you believe in, that we are better than, you know, calling out our better angels and not the demons that lie within us. I think that's, a, I still believe that we are an amazing people. And I still believe that there is a hunger for that kind of uh, campaign. And I get pretty excited about that. Yeah, I do too. I'm, I'm excited. Thank you for, thank you for, for talking with and, 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 and being excited. <laughs> But before we go to audience questions, can you uh, uh, talk a little bit? We're on the on the campus here of, uh, of KU, and, and there's some students who are thinking about going into politics. What got you into politics, and uh, what, what was the what was the thing that hooked you? It was that bald guy telling me about his pants. That <laughs> 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 oh, I, I I grew up with with politics, with my dad covering it with the Star. I had Bob Dole came to our house and. In 67, I guess he was a congressman and he was thinking about running for Senate. And back then, the newspapers were a big deal and the Star was a really big deal in Kansas. And so, people, I, in, but they still didn't pay reporters very well. I shared a bedroom with my three sisters, so it was a, a small house. And I, just looking back at it, I, I, I cringe and laugh when I worked for him later, knowing Dole was absolutely wonderful, but he, he was an intense person to work for in many ways. But um, so Dole comes to our house, our dining room furniture was not the best and held together in some cases by rubber bands and one of them snapped and the chair fell apart and hit Dole. <laughs> and, so, and then we got in the car and to take him down to an old Chiefs game at Old Municipal Stadium and my dad ran out of gas and so he had to get out and go walk for gas and I'm sitting there with Bob Dole and I'm just this dopey kid in the back seat and I thought, and years later, I thought, oh my God, he was, his head was about ready to pop off. <laughs> but, and I thought, well, this is interesting. And then I fell asleep. And so Dole, for a while, was sitting in a 67 Falcon by himself with a dopey kid asleep in the back seat. <laughs> All of that is just to say, I, politics was just part of what I did. And you did it not because of any grand and glorious achievement. You, you knew what it was really like. It was a lot of grunt work. But you knew that people had to take their turns doing things to make your community better that was a way to give back to your community and so that got me into it and then uh, i was fortunate enough to get the job with nancy casabon out in washington out of college and that was the rest is history the rest is whatever i i, I made it to the lawrence school board <laughs> <laughs> let's take some audience questions folks have yes sir what Scott, I really, I really uh, applaud this effort to get a new movement established, and I, for one, will be eager to join it. But uh, realistically, what do you see as the major obstacles or roadblocks that could prevent the amount of success that you're hoping for? And should you not be able to, re to achieve that success, what do you see as the future of the movement? <coughs> I mean, I, I think faith is in, in, just in the, in, the, in the issue is really what has why this will succeed. Because you, you, too many days you wake up thinking, what am I doing? How do we do this? There are too many reasons why this won't work. But if you believe in it, it really will happen because there is a genuine hunger for it. It may not happen this time. And so it would fail if we were you know, shallow people that just thought, well, we tried it, we're done. But if we know that, well, I can do this next summer in a heartbeat, and that, I absolutely know that, because 
You do not do a petition drive in the winter in Kansas. Um, that is not a good time to meet people out on the street. So if I, we do it, it'd be next, starting next April, you get six month window to do this. And in that six months, we would absolutely get it. And then we would start the building of the party. So you, it's like anything that you're starting that's new, that's hard, you've got to believe in it. You've got to find a group of people who are willing to believe in it. And then it will move forward. Um, I mean, anybody in here who wants to help, it, the, the army is, is open. But um, I, I don't see any fatal obstacles. I just see challenges that can be met. You probably already answered this question, but have, have you approached Greg Orman, or has he approached you? Um, uh, we, I had lunch with, with Greg, and I met him when, we, uh, when I was running for uh, Secretary of State. That was the same year he ran against Pat Roberts for U.S. Senate. And so I had met him out there a couple of times. I had lunch, and he is, and I'd read his book. Um, he is very much, I mean, he, he's intrigued, I guess, but we're two different groups. I mean, um, I, we, I guess, I, I mean, that's the honest answer. I mean, it's not, he's not part of what we're doing. I, th I mean, you, you know Greg Orman better than I do. Um, so he wasn't interested in being part of what we're doing. Um, and we are operating as though he's, he is what he is, but we're interested in very much a party that goes down ballot, that worries about the state house, that worries about all the other offices, and that builds a bench of people that can then become productive members who can run for higher office with the experience necessary to do it right. Is that the right answer? It was the right answer. Okay. I have no inside information on that, but, but, uh, but I do know that uh, uh, it's important that, that independents and folks who are fed up with the parties need to, there's not enough uh, uh, good people who are thinking along the same line. So let's be hopeful that uh, uh, folks can find the same channel to swim in. Well, and I, I have said I don't want to be the Venezuela opposition where every, they, it's amazing for as messed up as that country is that their opposition still manages to fight over who, who I mean, it's, at some point you have allies and you, and you figure you're working towards the same goal. I think he's got a vision that I guess is different than ours, um, but what we're trying to do doesn't necessarily interfere with what he's trying to do, um, but he's not part of what we're doing. How can someone get a petition to sign? I, that was a great question. Um, <laughs> we, we, well, Annie back there has them. I have them. I, know, I think I left, did I put my stack out there? Of petitions? Um, no, but I have. Oh, I screwed that up. Um, yeah, I have a big stack of them. Um, and then there's our website has them where you can download to uh, partyofthecenter.org, and you can just download it. It is a little bit convoluted. I mean, there is an intentional obstacle to entry in this market. The two parties are not very interested in this happening. But it is not that. It sounds more convoluted than it is. And signing it is really simple. You just sign it. Um, if you're circulating it, you have to do, there are some steps you have to take. But just signing it is as straightforward as can be. Um, uh, but we, we do have petitions here. And we would love to have your help. Or what we really love is your signature. The Secretary of State's not going to take you to trial. To... I'm sure he will. <laughs> but as long as he defends himself, I think we're OK. <laughs> That, that wasn't meant as a compliment. <laughs> Anyone else? Any other questions? Well, uh, thank you, everybody. I appreciate everybody coming out today. Scott, thank you. No, uh, thank you. This has been fun. I enjoyed it. Your success. Thank you. Uh, and I want everybody to mark on their calendars for April 4th, uh, Wednesday, April 4th. Uh, we're going to be joined by Chad Peace of the Independent Voter Network will be here in town really interesting stuff that they're working on on a national scale that goes to a lot of things that Scott was talking about. So thank you all for coming out. Appreciate it. And we'll see you next time.
know, someone I could pop in, but um, I, I, I did. I absolutely missed out. Frank, do you know? No, no. Frank, do you know? We had a really good audience. I had a nice session. Yeah, that's what I heard. Yeah, yeah, I had a lot of fun. I, I came in just for a brief meeting, and then I got told there's a problem with the bill, and then it was like, oh my god, it's over. Well, you all have brought some uh, many things to sign. No, I, I almost won this budget to move, but, but just over a little bit. Okay. Just a little bit over. I see it got there. What's going to happen?